to the Freedom Factory's Creativity Unleashed podcast. Join me, Tiffany McIsaac, and my partner in creative pursuits, Melanie Pinto, as we explore creativity as a state of mind rather than a talent we're born with. Here you'll find guided meditations, insightful conversations, and evocative tools to help you unleash your full potential. Because when we live life from a place of creative thinking, the opportunities are endless. Hello and welcome to Creativity Unleashed. As female entrepreneurs, it was such a pleasure to meet today's guest in our gallery a few years back at a release party we had for a mutual friend. Not only were we fans of her work playing roles on shows like Working Moms, Letterkenny, and Orphan Black, but we were so impressed with this powerful woman who holds space and creates opportunity for so many other women. It is a true pleasure to introduce Jess Salguero. Tune in as we talk about how she stays grounded in an industry full of rejection, how women are reclaiming sex on the big screen, and her advice to women in the arts. Enjoy the podcast and be sure to hit subscribe if you're feeling it. Hey Jess, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So how's this time in quarantine been? Are you using it to sort of be really productive and get all the things you've been wanting to do done? Are you kind of slowing down and recharging? Hmm. It's definitely come in waves. It's been, it's been different kinds of waves. There's been moments of slowing down and there's definitely been some days that feel quite productive. Mm -hmm. I'd say though, it's been a lot of, it's been a lot of inner work. It's been a lot of internal stuff. It's Mm -hmm. been less focused on output and, and, um, you know, creating something that can be like consumed or packaged and given to the world. It feels like a lot of what this has been for me has been a lot of journaling and like recentering and trying to get a very you know consistent meditation practice um yeah it's been it's been really is it it's not what I would have thought it was going to be to be honest Mm -hmm. but it's what I needed it's Mm -hmm. what I needed Mm -hmm. I feel like everyone needed that to just kind of like shut the world out a little bit and go in yeah Oh yeah. And it's, it's crazy. What is there when you, when everything's too loud to listen, you know, to really listen to yourself. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a really weird space because my realized something that my creativity definitely comes from when I am listening to myself, like when I really like let the, the barriers down, let the gates down, Mm -hmm. that's when I think my best stuff is unleashed or whatever (laughs) released. And um, yeah, it's really interesting because the past two years I've been feeling like, Oh, it's interesting. I'm not feeling as creative as, as I normally do, like I'm not really like writing as much as I normally do. And I, I knew I was scared of something. Like I, I knew that there was something there. I was like, I'm, I'm sort of not wanting to dig too deep, mm. which was fine, which was fine at the time. I kind of needed to coast for a bit. Cause I, I'm a Scorpio and I can go pretty dark. I can go pretty like deep and dark. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so I was kind of, coasting I think for for a bit and now I've hit another spot where it's like whoa and I mean it has a lot to do with like I'm going through a breakup during quarantine so it's like wow okay now there's no distraction you know (laughs) there's no like let's just go out and go dancing or like I'm just gonna surround myself with my friends all the time and like you know not um not have to be alone, not have to be alone with my thoughts. Mm -hmm. And this is really like, no, you have to sit with this. And it was funny because I was talking to another friend who's also going through a breakup right now. And and she was like, 
she's like, I can't figure out if quarantine's like a good time to go through breakup or bad time. And we were talking about that and we were saying like the pros and cons of it or whatever. But I was like, I'm just gonna look at it as a good a yeah. good time to do it because I mean that makes my life better believing that. Um, <laughs> um but, but yeah or from a distance. So, sorry? Are you guys sharing space right now or is it from a we are a few blocks away from each other. Yeah. And uh you mean me and me and the ex or me and my friend? The ex. <laughs> yeah, a few blocks away. Yeah. Um and yeah, it's just time has slowed the fuck down and it's just it's a trip, man. It's a trip. It it feels like there's just some major overhaul healing, um, reflecting, reclaiming happening. Do you and think like when you have, whether it's a breakup or just some kind of hard mm -hmm. and normal life, then we do yeah. we go with our friends, we jump into work, we do all these things that distract from how we're feeling, but it's going to hit you eventually, whether it's six months later or a year later, like it's going to hit you. Oh, yeah process those things so oh yeah I feel like this kind of well you got to process it now it's true it's true it's like I, and my my roommate who I live with who's just like my best friend she was saying you know when this is all over you're gonna feel like it's gonna be such an interesting space to enter the world again mm -hmm. like you're going to, she's like, you're going to be like kind of a different person. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm, and I'm sort of feeling that in a way, like there's, there's just a lot of kind of big foundational shifting happening. And um, it's just like this wealth of <laughs> creativity that comes out because it's like, where do I put all this? Where, where, where do I put all of this feeling? Where do I put all of this grief? Where do I put all this, you know, revelation? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, and, and I mean, I don't want to feel like, oh, I have to go through my major chaos in my personal life to be creative. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I do think my creativity comes from um, those spaces that, that really need a voice that I don't normally give a voice to. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't have to be chaos, but chaos definitely helps it, you know, come to the surface. Um, so. We can get so busy that it takes chaos for us to stop and look in. Totally. Totally. It's interesting. I, I had interviewed this woman a few years ago, her name is Zara. She's um this fertility coach. She's super amazing. And I asked her about like intuition and if as you get older, does it speak louder to you? And she's like, no, it's the opposite. It's quieter because you listen sooner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, ooh. She's like, you hear those whisperings. You mm -hmm. listen to them. You don't just go, mm, no, I'm going to you know distract myself or just fill my head with something else mm -hmm. something that's easier and um yeah so she's like you just listen to her and I'm like oh damn <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah it's it's revealed a, a lot to me it's revealing a lot to me mm -hmm. I'd say what happens with what's been happening with creativity and just age is I feel like I'm getting a bit more specific with my expressions now like I'm I'm not just like fumbling through the void being like what is going on I'm sort of like kind of have a bit more of a handle of of all the facets and all of the the influences happening mm. it's interesting anyway <laughs> this is mostly like me and my journal it's just like <laughs> <laughs> I um read my journal when I go back it's so visceral 
that I'm like, yeah. I don't even know what that word says. My writing is looks like a yeah. description, like a doctor's note. Totally. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I was thinking that the other day. I was like, I'm never gonna be able to make any clarity out of this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's okay. But yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I, I it's interesting. Like I'm not. I don't play a musical instrument. Like I play a little bit of guitar, mm. but I've been just like obsessed with my guitars like I have two guitars here lately that because I'm like I just need a place to put this oh my gosh musicians are so lucky I'm like oh to have that like handle on an instrument and just be able to to play to put it somewhere yeah yeah I feel like with with age in general Mm -hmm. um I don't feel like I, you know, have my shit together. I'm 35. And so it's like, oh, I'm 35 now. Like I should have everything figured out. I don't. It's just like you said, with creativity, you kind of have a better Mm -hmm. handle on all of it. Mm -hmm. React to everything. It's like all just like a little more composed and calm and, or the way you care about it is a little less or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. maybe. And maybe there's less fear and anxiety around it. Mm -hmm. like maybe there's less like I don't know and I need to know it's a a bit of like just breathe yeah you know yeah and you know yourself more each year I think so you'll Mm -hmm. know have a better handle too on you know what are you wanting to express yeah totally and the fear of it the fear and anxiety quiets down because you've also lived through more now Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like the answer will reveal itself. It always does. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, something will reveal itself. Something will become more clear to you. It always does. Mm -hmm. And you can just, I just trust it more, Mm -hmm. trust life more, I guess. (laughs) In so many ways. Also, you're like, sorry. I was talking to a girl a little while ago who's 23, I think. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I don't know what I want to do. I'm 23. I need to figure it out. And I was like, no, you're 23. You don't need to figure it out. That's the whole point. You're only 23. Just yeah. go, figure it out. Like everything comes with time. Oh, the anxiety. <laughs> it's the anxiety. It's like when you have no responsibilities often in your <laughs> early twenties is like when you're like the most anxious. I know. Yeah. And it's, it's so ironic. Yeah. <laughs> it's so ironic. Yeah. You um, have been playing so many awesome roles over the last few years and working moms. I loved your character. On working moms. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Thanks. You were voted Tiff's Rising Star. How it does or how did the early 20s Randolph Academy student envision mm-hmm. or did you envision all of the, that success when you were that age? Mm. Uh, yeah, I, in a way, I mean, I, I definitely knew this was the space I wanted to be in. Mm. And I didn't necessarily know I was going to unfold. Like, I, I don't think I... I remember making a vision board though that like this was like probably I was like in my mid twenties and on the vision board was like Tiff and like Now Magazine or whatever mm-hmm. and um and then like some other stuff like like stream streaming services like Netflix blah 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 like things I wanted to work for work networks I wanted to work for and stuff and uh and it's pretty cool, like, when you think back and you're, like, now when I think back, I'm like, oh, yeah, I did all that stuff. But the thing is, I, I definitely thought it was going to happen, like, within it, within a few months, <laughs> you know, when I made this vision for it. Like, it's going to happen right away. Um, it's so funny. We totally, you know, overestimate what we can do in a month but we always underestimate what we can do in like a decade. Mm-hmm. Like it's like so much, so much can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, but we so 
on the short term, we put so much pressure on ourselves. Um, yeah, I kind of, I imagined it, but the road to, you know, anywhere is the joke. If you think you can predict it. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it plays out exactly how it wants and how it's supposed to. And, and, uh, I mean, that's the fun of it, too. It's the fun of life. You can put an intention out there and maybe it'll, you know, come to fruition, but it's likely not in the way that you imagined it. And not without taking the steps to making it happen. Mm-hmm. So many mm-hmm. people make the vision board and then you kind of like sit back and wait. And so like you have to actually take the step. Sorry, my dog. Put Sorry if you hear my dog. Oh, no, that's okay. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> go on. Sorry. I wanted to jump in the video. <laughs> um yeah no, it's like you make the vision board but you have to do all the things to put it into motion and then mm-hmm. like, like stick it out yeah yeah it's I uh read this and I, it's I'm doing it again which is amazing I bet I read this book called the desire map mm. probably yeah, like maybe six years ago or something. I, that's the first time I read it. And it's a workbook. And the whole point of it is like to find what your core desired feelings are. And so the idea is like not to be motivated by like, I want to win an Oscar. Or I want to win a Pulitzer Prize or whatever. It's like, I want to feel um, respected or I want to feel... Uh, abundantly creative Mm. I want to feel um, that I'm impacting the world in a good way or something Mm -hmm. anyway the point of it is you get really specific about what you want to feel instead of you know the being motivated by anything outside of yourself Mm -hmm. and so um, I remember that was a big game changer for me because once I read this it's like okay, what does, like, my vision board saying, now magazine, what does that mean? Okay, if I go outside of myself, it means, like, I want a feature on now magazine, or I want to be on the cover of now magazine, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, like, I really had to distill it down to, like, no, what do I want to feel? Like, why would I want to be on the cover? Why would I want to be featured in it, or whatever? Mm -hmm. And it's, like, oh, wait, I just want to feel like I'm creative and relevant in my community and I'm making things that are important. Mm -hmm. I want to just be on the cover of something for no fucking reason or like because I'm wearing a hot outfit or some shit, right? So it's like I want it to actually be because it means something and Mm -hmm. because I'm a valued artist in this community. And so once I started to think about things that way, it was like, oh, okay, what spaces help me feel like that? And and so it would be like, oh, I'm going to start, you know, going to more creative um, um, meetup groups or artist retreats or whatever. And it's like, oh, I feel a part of the community. That's all I really wanted was to feel a part of the community. And so then, and then what's so interesting is like, then those, the outside things actually come because the recognition of, of an authenticity exactly. of it coming from an authentic place. So, um, so I, I mean, I had to learn that and I've always had to refresh it. I always have to refresh it because there'll be times, there'll be days where I'm like, I need a goddamn Emmy. <laughs> and I'm like, hold on. What's going on here. You want to be part of a project that means something. That's actually what you want. You want to have a character that has a really interesting, honest, like badass arc okay, that's something else aside from getting an Emmy. That's just the results of this. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Otherwise, you just get so off track. If you're guided by that shit, you get so off track. You're like, oh, wait, everyone who, wears, who wins Emmy Awards is has beautiful long hair and is 100 pounds or something. And then you start getting motivated by the wrong things. You're like, oh, I have to look like that. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's... Uh, it's really interesting. It's just being motivated from a different space. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's so important to create 
like you said, from that place of authenticity, Mm -hmm. it's so easy to get distracted by all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And there's so many, like, there's just so many ways to get into your authenticity. Mm. Like, I don't know if I have a formula. I feel like it comes in different ways right now. It's coming to me because of heartbreak. It really is, Mm -hmm. you know, like being like having to be my own champion again. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like in partnership, sometimes you have to sort of remember that or remember like, yes, this person is, you know, absolutely a support and a pillar for you. But then, always have to kind of have these reminders of like, wait, 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 I also need to like have my, my own back or, um, or just, it's like, it's a codependency shit. You know what I mean? It's like, you can have it with anyone. It doesn't have to be a partner. It could be with a friend. It could be with whatever. Um, but, uh, but yeah, there's just so many ways. There's been times where I've, where I've accessed, my creativity because I was so fucking angry, Mm -hmm. so frustrated that I wasn't getting anywhere, getting anywhere in quotes in my career and, 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 you know, get going, but really going through anger to get there. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, it's so, it's so interesting because I feel like, rarely is it through joy and i wish it was Mm -hmm. like i'm i'm now undoing some of that shit where i'm going like what's that about like why do you feel like you can't celebrate and like create out of a really beautiful joyful place like Mm -hmm. you feel like you need to be in turmoil and um yeah i i think that that's a a thing that our generation is hopefully going to start looking at deeper Mm -hmm. why do we feel like we can't you know, stay and create in a space of joy for a certain amount of time. Because everything to, changes. But yeah, anyway. I used to only create from a place of pain or anger. Yeah. I remember someone saying to me, like, you only go in that studio when you're pissed off. And it's like, yeah, it was the only, like you said, time I could, like, actually pull something up or come up with an idea. Whereas now it's the opposite. Like I can't create when I'm in that. Mm-hmm. Place. I just like feel oh, wow. only out of a place of joy. Oh, that's amazing. But sometimes I wish it was because it's like, sometimes <laughs> I to take that and put it somewhere. But lately that's where I could feel a block. But yeah. Oh, wow. That's cool. I that's like, really cool. You know, being in that, flow state and so you know I do do think there's like things we can do in certain moments like physically to kind of tap into that Mm -hmm. rather than because I feel like that's where the place so many people are it's like you're either creative or you're not you're like waiting to unblock so you can create again rather than just sort of like being in that place all the time yes but it's hard it does take those (laughs) sometimes it does sometimes it does (laughs) <laughs> I've been reading like a lot about like the pleasure revolution, like pleasure activism and as um essentially being like lean into what feels good mm-hmm. because so often we've been told that I mean especially as women but we've been told that what makes us feel like if we if we do that too much we're indulgent and we're selfish. Mm-hmm. And so uh yeah anyway this has just been something i've been thinking about a lot over the past years like oh like that's also a really beautiful revolutionary piece of art if you're gonna lean into what feels fucking good because so much we we don't you know we're like oh we shouldn't be presenting ourselves like that or like we shouldn't be showing off or blah 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 and it's interesting because you know we can all see on Instagram, you know, there's definitely some people that are kind of celebrating. It seems like they're celebrating themselves and, and 
you know, have hot pictures up or whatever. And I'm not sure if that's exactly the same thing as what I mean. Maybe, but also maybe I'm judging them. I don't really know, but it's, I, I, there are certain people when I see them really celebrating themselves, I'm like, I feel empowered. Like, I'm like, wow, I know that's brave of you to do. You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, and, and I'm so inspired by your like self love, really. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, wow, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. And where it's not, it's not, it's so hard to to know what is again authentic and what's not but when you can feel like it's coming from a place that doesn't it's doing it because it's proud of they're proud of themselves not because they need validation you know what I mean from their viewers I think Um, for so long we were you know this like persona of an artist was this like dark place and like mysterious and like inward and like, Oh, I'm an artist. And it's like, Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, that's changing as the world's Mm -hmm. becoming more woke uh, and all these things. Yeah. It's really changing and mental health wasn't talked about and all these things weren't talked about. So you just Mm -hmm. put it in your art and kind of had this character was now we can actually open up and talk about these things, those platforms and, yeah, I feel like self-love and positivity and all of that is definitely something we can like per- be like part of our yeah. persona now. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Do you totally. Know, uh, do you know Clear Mortify? You may have seen Who? Clear Mortify. No, you may have seen them. Like uh, they performed at the gallery and stuff a lot. Um, musician. They live in LA now, but uh, one of the like biggest examples of that, like self-love persona, you should check them out. Yeah. Well, how do you spell them? I will look them up. Clear, like C-L-E-A-R, Mortify, M-O-R-T-I. I will definitely check them out. They're on an episode of our podcast as well coming up, but um yeah, the music's amazing, but like so much of it is so much, so much so. Like I had a, um, a Reiki session um, with Clear once, mm-hmm. Reiki for me, but it was like heal yourself through like self pleasure, like pleasure your body and think mm-hmm. about the trauma while you're doing it, and just like literally send love and pleasure to that trauma. But we don't, like you said, we're so distance from that and it does seem so indulgent or this or that like we've never thought to heal yourself physically by pleasuring yourself physically (laughs) it's like oh yeah oh yeah Mm -hmm. that's huge Mm -hmm. I'm I'm a I'm a big fan of that (laughs) writing songs um Mm -hmm. in the middle of that it's like oh yeah I, I forget what the lyric was it was basically just like I'm pleasuring myself and writing music at the same time. And it's just like, yeah, when you're in that like pleasure, joyful space is when like things are really flowing. It's so true. Like what a better way to tap into that creating from a place of joy (laughs) space. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I love the like sending yourself like healing vibes. Yeah. And well, an orgasm is so powerful. (laughs) <laughs> it's the it's like the most amazing biggest release of energy mm. and we just often just like release it for no reason right yeah. well not i don't mean no reason but you know what i mean like it, it's not dedicated the energy is not dedicated to something mm-hmm. and like some some ancient cultures believe that that energy was supposed to be intentionally used to create life mm-hmm. to be like you and the person that you're creating life with collectively are like sending this huge burst of joy into the cosmos like and that's gonna be like your the life that you create together and that's like amazing when you think about it you're like whoa that makes sense like yeah. this this creation of energy is like so powerful mm-hmm. and yeah and I've often thought of of that like well this release of energy it should it why aren't we using it like dedicating it to something intentionally using it for something 
Mm -hmm. So yeah, I've kind of started doing, I have started doing that. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> um, this other thing that I, that I've just started dipping my toes into, which is interesting is I was talking to my coach. I have like a life coach and she's so badass. She's all about pussy consciousness and she's amazing. Um, so actually we were talking about self parenting ourselves mm. and she was saying that she did a lot of this work a while back and she started reading books on conscious parenting, like targeted for parents to raise their kids. She doesn't have her own kids, but she was like, I'm going to start reading these books. Cause I, I think I need to reparent my like inner child. Because there is some trauma that is still being triggered and, you know, there's still this scared child inside. And that is something that has really come up for me recently, like where I'm like, whoa, I'm like a little girl again. What in these moments of like heightened emotion or like, you know, just really intense emotional circumstances. And, and so now I'm, I'm like dabbling into these books and being like, Oh, I'm gonna try kind of reparenting myself. What does that look like? Um, at, at this point, I'm not sure, but I think it's from the little bits that I've that I've received. Is it's like when you catch yourself, say you did something wrong, quote unquote wrong. You forgot something, or you you know made a mistake on something you sent to a client or whatever. And, you know, depending on what your, how you've been trained or <laughs> um, what your response is to that, you know, it might be like, you're so stupid. You know, it might be like these things that we do in our brains. Like, how did you fucking do that? How'd you forget that? Mm -hmm. You're an idiot. And I guess just catching those moments and being like, no, you just forgot. You don't have to attach the you're an idiot or you're irresponsible or, you know, all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. You can be like, you just forgot. That's okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just being like the nicest parent <laughs> ever to your, <laughs> to your inner talk. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely kind of dive into this. I'll, I'll love follow up about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Melanie and I know you, uh, at the gallery as such a powerful woman and a woman who creates space and opportunity for other women. Um, mm -hmm. would you say that that perspective has influenced your career and the roles that you've chosen? That is, first of all, like such a high compliment. Thank you so much. Um, has it influenced the roles I've cho chosen? It's interesting because I'll be honest, uh, not until very recently have I been very choosy with my parts mm -hmm. by nature of, I'm a kid of immigrants that just wanted to make money and be able to show my parents that I could support myself and do this mm -hmm. um <laughs> also like fear mentality scarcity mentality oh my gosh this is gonna run out and then I'll uh, I'll never work again like I need to take this job because who knows when another job's coming like all of that mm -hmm. so it's really now that because I feel a bit more stable in my career that I can be a bit more selective but it's hard it's very hard for me to say no to things like if if someone especially someone like asks offers something to me and asks me and I'm like oh my god it's it's hard to say no mm -hmm. I'm I'm working on that mm -hmm. but I I think what when I think back it was interesting I was in LA right before this happened the COVID the COVID um mm -hmm. and I had a headshot session with a photographer and and she was like, so like, what kind of roles do you want? Like, let's, let's suit the headshots to the kind of roles you want. And it was so interesting because I was like, actually, I get to play all the kinds of roles I want. I'm not, not 
getting those chances. I actually love the things that people think of me for. And she's like, oh, that's, you're really lucky then. And I was like, yeah, I think I am. And I think it's, again, it's sort of like doing the in some of the inner work that people are just picking up on who I am mm -hmm. rather than me having to put on a costume and be like, see, I'm a tough chick now. You know what I mean? I'm like, how about you just try to be yourself as much as possible? And that's pretty tough. That's pretty badass <laughs> in this world. Um, so, so I've been really lucky. Like, I feel like I've been really lucky that, that, that it's been translated that people see it i guess mm -hmm. um i've also just had like over the past couple of years like just such a deep reverence for sisterhood for um i just think the greatest crime that we commit and that has been committed to us is pitting ourselves against each other mm -hmm. and have you listened to the new fiona apple album no when okay it came out a few weeks ago ah catch the bolt cutters it's an amazing album she has this song on it called ladies mm -hmm. and it's this really like loungy languid song it's so it's so good but in it she's talking to her ex's new girlfriend mm. and the whole song she's being like um like why should we compare ourselves to anyone else mm -hmm. every love is so different mm. and she even says like hey that dress i left in the closet you should keep it it'll look good on you and you know what it wasn't even my dress it was the woman before me it was her dress. <laughs> me. Like, it's just like this. And, and she's saying like, we live in a world where like these amazing women are being created and, and, you know, growing up and being themselves. And it's just this thing of like, that's awesome. And I want to stop thinking about it, that their brilliance somehow dims my brilliance. Like, Let's just all be brilliant. And I say this, but I, I mean, I struggle with this all the time. I, I have not fucking mastered this. I get jealous. I get envious. I, um, you know, think, uh, yeah, I, I think like, oh my gosh, well, maybe they, maybe they wouldn't help me. Why should I help them or blah, 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 blah. Those thoughts still happen, but I really try to kind of, um, what's the word sort of like, um, get to them like nip them in the bud pretty yeah. much <laughs> um, because that shit's poison that shit is fucking poison mm -hmm. because it's so true we should not be comparing ourselves to each other and the idea that there's only like a certain amount of women that are allowed to be in any kind of space or, or be um, put on any kind of pedestal is just such fucking bullshit mm -hmm. and yeah, it, it's a revolutionary thing to be helping each other. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the world is just going to be such a better place. Yeah. <laughs> because again, like putting the competition shit, that's all fucking like patriarchal hierarchy bullshit. Like, it's been um, changed. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, so much of of a woman's worthiness has been taught to us that it's how long we can keep a man's gaze mm -hmm. like how long we can keep a man um around and i'm just i mean i've i've been doing un unlearning a lot of this stuff for a while but like it just gets to a deeper level of it every day pretty much but like every phase of my life i I'm relearning a lesson, but it's a deeper version of that lesson, you know? So <laughs> I think that's like, um, a Sufi, like Islamic mysticism. They say like life isn't a circle. It's a spiral. 
Mm. And like, so you keep coming back to the same place, but again, it's like a deeper spot. Mm -hmm. I remember like the way that things were between girls, like when I was in high school and I do feel like things are changing. I hope things are changing. Hopefully, you know, our generation can start to break down those barriers for the younger ones or actually even younger girls I find are influencing women my age and women older. Totally. Than oh my gosh. I think the younger generation is so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I, the, I remember years ago I was, I was going to the YMCA, like, uh, yeah, the one on Dundas and I would see girls that I think were like probably 17 16 17 working out full on like hairy pits like they were just rocking mm-hmm. au natural and i was like wow they're mm-hmm. so brave like i i was like i I'm, i can't even do that <laughs> and now i now i don't give a shit now i'm like yeah but i remember being like whoa mm-hmm. the younger generation is there are some really incredible humans mm-hmm. <laughs> and thank thank god goddess whatever the universe because they're the ones that are going to save the world <laughs> like we need the younger generations to be amazing because our planet needs them <laughs> you know do you feel like things are actually easier now than they were 10 years ago for women in the yeah. arts in the arts mm-hmm. Well, in my industry, yes, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, it feels just so much safer. Mm-hmm. It really does. Since Me Too and Time's Up, it feels like I do not have to, not only do I have to like, before it was like, not only do I have to think about like my job, mm-hmm. I have to think about, creeps on set to think about if I'm doing a nude scene oh my god all the navigating around that or like anything anything intimate like you know there was just always like this kind of lack of sensitivity or respect Mm -hmm. and so that in and of itself but also the fact of the fact that women are people are realizing how awesome women's voices are Mm -hmm. that they're just more female writers Mm -hmm. and and also just like queer people gender non-binary people of color like there's so many more voices Mm -hmm. and people see the value of that and the stories are different Mm -hmm. the stories are different and I feel way better as an artist in these spaces like telling a story that disrupts the normal narrative that we're used to Mm -hmm. um and yeah it's i i think it's a way better spot than 10 years ago for sure for sure there's shit that people would say that they cannot fucking say yeah like there'd be stuff like i'd be like on set wearing a g-string and like people would like say shit now oh my god if a fucking anyone in the crew said something about my body on set while i'm in this super vulnerable position Mm -hmm. they'd be fucking fired on the spot i swear to god they'd be like people be like are you are you crazy like don't you realize the difference in like power right now Mm -hmm. it's like a young actress like naked (laughs) um but yeah no things things have things have changed things have definitely changed I feel like in all industries it's sort of like my partner and I talk about this a lot where it's like you know oh it's a man's world it's a man's world but it actually is a man's world like in the sense that almost all industries have been created by men are being run yeah. by men. And so, mm-hmm. yes, we need to work hard to change things from within, but we also, as women, or like you said, people of color, minorities, we need to mm-hmm. create a new narrative. And so whether it's starting a business, um, 
and then you know you're hiring the staff you're creating the work environment Mm -hmm. or in art like like you said females are starting to do way more writing and so Mm -hmm. yeah I feel like that's where you see real change is when we actually like take things by the reins and create that story and put women in roles that we want to see ourselves in totally totally and then creating the dynamic on set yeah it's just uh setting that oh yeah Mm -hmm. it it it, like for example i remember i was doing this show and it was all female writers and female director and i'm doing a scene where i'm in bed with my boyfriend and we're like making out like about to kind of like get it on i have all my clothes on he doesn't Mm. he's like naked he has like something covering his lower half but um and he said to me it's so interesting you could tell women wrote this Mm -hmm. and i and i was like oh oh yeah and i'm like actually you could tell that women a woman directed this Mm. and i talked to the director and i told her i was like so interesting we realized something i realized something that if you were a male director, I almost certainly would be in my underwear and he would have his clothes on. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, I know. This was an intentional choice. Mm -hmm. We all made an intentional choice because we actually also think it's sexy that he's about to take his clothes off. Yeah. What about all that sexiness that happens? Why are we just like, oh, chick with her fucking tits out? Like, Mm -hmm. what, what about the fact that he's like, about to Mm -hmm. that's so hot you know so it's like again like it's disrupting what we see and these things do make a big difference like some you know sometimes I can be like man are we just encouraging people to like waste their lives and watch tv and like you know not go outside and explore and and like yeah sometimes I feel like that sometimes I have to grapple with that I have to understand how I'm like totally complicit in you know, the whole structure of our world. Um, But then there's moments where I'm like, when you see things on screen that are different Mm -hmm. than what you're used to, it means so much. My roommate and I have been watching Sex in the City because it's like, you know, a comfort, (laughs) like a comfort food. And I I was interesting because I was thinking about it. And Miranda said something like, I'm 34 years old and da, 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 da. And I was like, man, this was so revolutionary. Like single women in their mid thirties, like just living their life and like trying to do their best. Mm -hmm. I was like, this was so revolutionary at the time. You would never see this. Mm -hmm. You, a 30, whatever, four year old woman on TV at that time, probably have like two kids and be married. So I was just like, wow and they're making their lives look like fun and full of pleasure and the real loves of their lives are each other and it's like so dope like I was like this is awesome and so anyway now I'm again coming to a different (laughs) a deeper level of the sex in the city understanding timeless too pardon so timeless that show it is I mean there's definitely some stuff with like how people of color are not super present in that show or how they're portrayed, how they're often like the server or the maid or that stuff where it's like, oof, oof. I was watching Seinfeld the other day, some of mm-hmm. the early season, and I was shocked with the <laughs> super like, racist, racist um, homophobic, like all this stuff. It was just like, oh my God, wow. Like mm-hmm. thank God things have changed because I was shocked. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forget which movie I was watching recently, but the girl, the woman basically just went and, like, has her way with this man, gets off, and walks away. And I was just like, oh, my God, that's the first time I've seen a woman have an orgasm and peace out. Uh, <laughs> and the guy, like, n- not finish on TV. You never wow. see her all the time. Yeah, um, but so I was true. Just, yes, like my boyfriend noticed as well. Where it's just like, did she just like finish and he didn't? And yeah. Oh damn! <laughs> <laughs> oh 
Oh, it's great. That's really um, dope. At the gallery, we like our International Women's Day show is one of the most important shows for us probably of the whole year. Um, Mm -hmm. And like our most attended show every year, we change the theme a little bit. This year, our theme was yes. um, And kind of playing Mm -hmm. off of or inspired, you know, we started with like no means no, and then went to me too. And now we're sort of saying, well, Me Too is amazing and we needed Me Too. It still gives the expectation that women, or not that Me Too gives it, but just that there is still an expectation that women should say no. Um, mm. I don't I feel see like what you're saying. we're empowered yeah. to say yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that was the theme of this year's Women's Day show was yes and sort of empowering women to own their sexuality if they want to. Um, and be able to say yes. We partnered with the female condom and um, Oasis Aqua Lounge. And uh, oh, this is so cool! It was oh awesome. my god, this is amazing! <laughs> but it's just like you know, teaching young girls um, that sex is good, and obviously teaching yeah, safe sex and on all of these things and self love and respect and, but it also takes away so much of the gray area for men. When, when a woman wants to say yes, she can and would, it takes away that confusion of like, because so many women, I think we're still conditioned, like we still do sometimes say no because we want to be girlfriend material or whatever. Mm. Whether we realize it or not, there is still games, I think, sometimes being played subconsciously. And so I think empowering women to say yes um, kind of like alleviates a lot of that. Yes. Um, so I love that. That's so cool. That's so the next evolution of it. That's so, great. Yeah, it's, uh, what are your thoughts though surrounding like women's sexuality and learning to speak freely mm. and confidently and devoid of shame, especially in the film industry? Hmm. I think it's so deeply important. Um, I think it's so going to be so cool to see what, uh, what sex scenes start to look like in the future. Like, really? Not just like, oh, and then he falls off of her (laughs) and she's just like with the sheets covering her tits being like, yeah, it's nice. You know, (laughs) it's like, no, um, I'm so curious to I'm so curious to see my friend, a friend of mine and I are writing uh, a film right now. And she is, um, she's in the sex work industry. Mm-hmm. And um, I met her at this artist retreat and she's amazing. She's so amazing. And um, she has taught me so much about <sighs> She calls herself, like, she wrote a book. Her name's Andrea Werhun. She's totally, like, I'm sure she would be fine with me talking about this because she wrote this amazing book called Modern Whore. Mm-hmm. Um, and she calls herself a whore. Like, she's, like, and and it, she totally claims the word. Like, it's so fucking amazing. Um, and she's, yeah, she's just taught me a lot around the complexity of uh, specifically like her industry like she said this thing about how like the first time she walked into a strip club she knew that she was a convert she's like i felt like i entered the temple of the goddess and i was like she was like i am destined to be a whore like she was like this is my destiny Mm -hmm. and and she's a she's a dancer now, a stripper at a club, and she's like, oh, one second, my headphone fell out. And um, she just talks about how, like, her experience being on stage, that there's, like, this beautiful power she feels. I mean, sometimes she does, and sometimes I'm, I'm sure not every night you're going to feel like that, and you're going to have some fucking assholes in the audience that, that don't make you feel like a goddess. Um, but there's just... Oh, it's, it's just like, again, 
shattering so many of our judgments, so much of the archetypes we've been told and, and ways that those archetypes have been vilified, like that, like in, in some ancient cultures, a whore was like a divine woman who was like connecting you with the goddess Ishtar when you had sex with her. Like it was like a spiritual experience. It wasn't this disgusting, depraved thing that, that often it's been framed. And so, um, I'm, I'm so fascinated entering like dialogue with her. And as we're like trying to create this thing and, and um, we're setting it like in the late seventies in Toronto and like about all of these things about how so much to do with sex was shifting at that time. And like the women's lib had just happened, but like there was also this backlash against it. Like the eighties became very like more conservative. And anyway, there's just like, it's so interesting how humans evolve how societies change like <laughs> the sociology of all this is so interesting yeah. um but I, I again i just think it's a really exciting time right now and women are realizing that they don't need a man's permission to be sexual mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. and or anyone's permission um that they're going to stop looking at it as something shameful um that is a really i'm so happy to be a woman alive at this time for that reason it's yeah yeah, it's cool it's so interesting you know the way the way the world views like this idea of a stripper um Mm -hmm. it's like on one hand, we say, we talk about like all the empowered women. Mm-hmm. And yet at the same time, if you were to say like, husband, I want to be a stripper or mom and dad, I want to be a stripper. I walked in the building and I, I just like knew and I felt so empowered and excited. Mm-hmm. Like, and I'm so tapped into this sexual energy and I want to share that and mm-hmm. inspire people with it. Um, I just like, can't wait till we're actually at a place where those empowered women get to be empowered in those roles. Like society embraces that and celebrates it. Totally. And the thing is burlesque was a lot more like that. Mm -hmm. Like before things started to change a lot of, before a lot of things started to change, but um, I've been, I just watched this, doc it's amazing it's called the league of exotic dancers Mm. and it's all these women in their like 70s and 80s that were like pretty famous burlesque dancers Mm. and it's like their life stories and they are just like all so fucking fabulous Mm. and they're like they they loved it they were like it was amazing like when it was good it was good but then when we started being told that we needed to like take off our clothes or we needed to go sit on men's laps because they didn't have to do that before like it was a big change when people came off the stage it was so much less safe Mm -hmm. there was a space it's something about you know it's a performance it's separate the audience is separate Mm -hmm. and then when they came off the stage it it was the whole power kind of changed. Mm -hmm. And, um, but anyway, it's, it's such an awesome doc. And um, I mean, I I also want to make it clear that like, you know, there's definitely women in the sex industry that don't necessarily think it's empowering Mm -hmm. that are doing it because they just need the cash and the cash is empowering. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's not necessarily this whole, like, you know, uh, spiritual and, like, life's purpose calling for everyone. (laughs) Um, And that's totally fine, too. It's, uh, I just love that that people like her exist and that they can talk with such grace and um, 
honesty and education mm-hmm. about all the complexities of this because mm-hmm. they're also like yeah but you know our this is still for the male gaze mm-hmm. you know there's still stuff like that where they're like you know i still am making my money off of married men mm-hmm. i mean is that bad or bad? not i don't know are they being honest with their wives probably not mm-hmm. you know and and there's you know club owners that are assholes there's tons of like you know people cross customers crossing the line and so it's it's a complex issue but what i just like about it is that it's this is these are the kind of stories that i like to tell is is things that are contradictory because mm-hmm. life is like that yeah life has so many contradictions and if I, if we're just going to pretend like this is the right path this is you know uh someone who is navigating the world in this way is absolutely you know doing it morally and in alignment with their higher power and with god or whatever right and it's like there's no fucking clear Mm -hmm. path like it's all muddy and like let's just be honest about that that it's all so complex Mm -hmm. that's That's the stories i like i bet so many women would actually enjoy that profession but society, (laughs) like the current state of it um Mm -hmm. it's not something that they're going into like as women start to own our sexuality on tv in film like all these things um and like the narrative starts to change around women and sex and the sex industry and just kind of like taking it back and taking ownership of it. Like I bet there's so many women who are dying to express themselves like that, but don't because it's not. Oh yeah. Possible. Totally. I mean, these, again, like what we were just talking about in my industry, the thing is there has to be more female managers. Mm-hmm. There has to be more female club owners. Mm-hmm. Um, and to find a lot of the places that we know people aren't being trafficked, that we know all these things are yeah. happening, and yeah, exactly. Even like, I'm sure there are some women, fun. like, really, nothing. Most women don't enjoy a male strip club in the same way that women do, or men do, sorry, uh, watching women, like, you know, yeah, whether it's like watching a sex scene in a movie or the sex industry, like, in general, like, what is there for women? What is there for us to authentically express ourselves or also to get some enjoyment back? It's like interesting to see it all. If we, oh, yeah. Even porn, like, to see, like, you know, especially around the show that we did, the Yes Movement, like, really researching Mm -hmm. what the industry looks like right now and starting to see, like, porn sites coming out that are um, female directed. And we actually did, that's so cool. We did one show on this one um, Toronto, like male porn star, um, but his work had been in female directed films. Cool. It was like, yeah, it wasn't like this race to the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> Aggressive porn. Yeah. But it was still so hot. Even all the men were like, that was hot. Like, it's cool to see it shift and change and that's so massively important again because what we see massively influences us and as you know there's data coming out like about young men right now and how much their sex lives are being shaped by what they've watched on in porn Mm -hmm. so that's those that's you imagine young guys that have like access to the kind of porn that from a young age to be watching like this hardcore gangbang. When we were younger, it was like, yeah, magazines, the odd, like, I don't know, past 11, like cable channel or something. Yeah. 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 Like watching that kind of stuff before you've even had sex. And that'd be kind of like your first exposure. Have you watched euphoria the show euphoria? No. Oh my God. It's amazing. It's it, you, next show. You got to binge HBO euphoria. It's okay. amazing. It's about high school kids. Okay. And there's a really important interaction between, there's many important interactions, but there's one specifically between 
a guy and his new girlfriend and she's appalled by the way that he thinks they're supposed to have sex mm. and she tells him like why would you do that and he's like oh i th-. and it it's kind of this really sweet scene because he's like oh i thought that's what you wanted mm. and she's like no but then she's like but if i ask you then i want it like mm-hmm. a- ask me mm-hmm. and and maybe i will want it but i don't you know what I mean? And it was just such a beautiful kind of like conversation of like these missed understandings. Like also like how can we expect boys to be better if the system is, you know, yeah. created in this way? Like how, if this is what they're getting access to, how do we expect them to know that that's not how you're actually supposed to have sex? That's like, yeah. confusing. It's super confusing. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Bitches be witches. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like it is a movement that really does encourage women to like not have to live their life by these like societal norms. Uh, mm-hmm. What inspired that? Or what is um, that people that are listening and what inspired it? So um Bitches Be Witches is uh it's a blog slash online publication um where we say it's where feminism meets the divine feminine. And um, I, it came about because I was going through something in my mid twenties where I was going through an eating disorder and I was so frustrated that I looked the way I thought I was supposed to look, but yet I still wasn't getting anywhere as an actor. Mm. And um, I was going to give up acting. And my sister, who's like a birth doula, like super amazing Mm -hmm. writer and human, was like, I think you need to just like write about what's going on in you. Okay. And as I did it, I started to realize like, I'm just trying to make myself small because I think that's how I I can have any power in this world, which is so strange and Mm counterintuitive. Make yourself small. But it's, and as I started to, you know, unravel all of this, it was like, oh, I've been taught to take up less space in like every way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, physically, emotionally, spiritually, energetically. And so I started, I knew that the way to heal myself was to take up more space, Mm -hmm. not just to gain weight. And I knew I would spiral out into something else if I just did that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I need to take up more space in every way. This is like a holistic healing that needs to happen. And so as I did, I started to um, just read a lot about everything, (laughs) but read a lot about theories as to why the world is the way it is, how, you know, patriarchy has taken over and, Essentially, the the feminine has been denied and overlooked and seen, painted as weak, painted as irrelevant, irrational. Um, And so bringing, I I feel like it's part of like my life's purpose is like to reveal the feminine face of God, like to talk about the stuff that's been forgotten, that's been intentionally silenced. Mm -hmm. Um by lots of different groups of people religion yes but also you know just empires of the time that wanted to control people so um and the witch is just this symbol of a woman who really was listening to herself and her environment really closely connected to her environment Mm -hmm. and um understood you know something about metaphysics and and her body and and other women's bodies. And so I just felt like a, the witch is such a beautiful symbol of the kind of feminism that I feel and live by. Um, and which is sort of like an ancient knowledge, an ancient remembering. And um, yeah, so bitches be witches. I mean, the word is just like, or the phrase is really like, why have we been so um, indifferent 
to being called bitches in pop culture for so fucking long. <laughs> like, let's call ourselves witches. Like, essentially, it's like, forget that bullshit. Let's empower ourselves. So, bitches be witches. Um, <laughs> at the moment, I mean, it, the site is still up, but I'm definitely um, reconceiving of some things right now. So, I'm kind of going through a whole overhaul of it. Um, and yeah, yeah, that was an important thing in my life with, at the time too. It helped heal me. It was because I felt like I didn't have reference points of women who were listening to their own intuition or their own inner voices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you always hear of men who march to the beat of their own drum, you know, in, in culture, it's always like, yeah, that person was such a genius, such a creative genius, because they, he did it his way. Yeah. And I was like, where are the women? Why don't we talk about that? I don't even, like, I feel like all I'm supposed to do is just, like, fit what a magazine says I'm supposed to look like, how I'm supposed to behave. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started interviewing women that I felt like, hmm, I feel like they're probably really interesting. Like, I bet they really do things their way. Mm -hmm. And so I started interviewing some pretty badass women. And, and then um, me and my friend Emily, we felt like, why don't we also make it a space where people can like contribute pieces that they've worked on, whether it's like poetry, essays, um, music, anything that they feel um would resonate mm -hmm. into the the collective and um so yeah that's that's where it came from yeah i love it <laughs> <laughs> the, the monologue that you did that you posted thanks that's like so powerful i remember <laughs> seeing it like sort of right as we met and just being like holy shit like who is this woman yeah uh, thank you yeah, I got to get back into some poetry writing. I'm feeling that hard right now. Mm -hmm. It's um, acting, I'm assuming, is probably not the only. But, um, do you get, like, enough fulfillment out of acting? Or do you feel like you have other creative outlets that you need to tap into? That's an excellent question. I think I'm realizing that it's not the only thing. Mm -hmm. I've been very I've been quite busy the past few years with work so I've kind of let uh well I've kind of sort of had to just put my own stuff down for a bit um and I'm realizing how much I deeply miss that mm -hmm. and I feel I feel like all the parts of myself come together <laughs> when I'm really creating something. Mm -hmm. um, and acting feels like I'm using my arms, but then really creating my own thing feels like I'm using my whole body. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I'm realizing that, that, that I would like to go back there. Mm -hmm. Is it mostly like writing? Yeah, it's most it's mostly writing, mm -hmm. um, writing and performing my own stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean this thing that I'm writing with my friend Andrea and two other writers w w feels really exciting, and um, that that's definitely something that. And it'll be a film. Yeah. Nice. Are you going to be in it? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That'll be good. What else are you working on right now? Um, oh my God. Nothing really, I guess. I'm I mean, I'm I I was supposed to be starting a huge show this month. Mm -hmm. So that's been delayed until who knows when. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was supposed to start another show and probably go into another show. So I kind of had my whole year like already booked up with stuff. Mm -hmm. And this has changed everything because I don't know if some of this stuff is still going to film 
I don't know if it's like all the shows that I'm doing are American shows. So it depends on if the American productions will be able to come up here. Like if the stars and the directors will be able to fly up here. So many things that are unknown right now. So right now I'm just like parenting my inner child and <laughs> writing this movie. <laughs> kind of nice to be able to have that time to just like pause oh, yeah. the health project yeah oh yeah and like me and me and my roommate slash wife slash best friend are completely like revamping our whole apartment and we yeah and that feels so good and we have such an awesome routine like of cooking and we're just we have two dogs we're like just trying to be like really domestic right now and it's so nice yeah so nice do you um do you feel like as a canadian actress you can like fully develop here the way that you want to or do you think that like at some point you'll have to move whether it's like the states or abroad it's funny because I think I've always felt like I'd have to move. Mm-hmm. It feels different now. I feel like if I move to LA, it'd be because I want to, not because I feel like I have to. Mm-hmm. It's just because California is quite beautiful. But it used to be genu- generally that if you're a Canadian actor, you'd hit, at some point, you'd hit a glass ceiling and you'd have to go to LA because they only hire like, Canadians for smaller parts Mm -hmm. on big American stuff here. So you have to go to LA to be considered for leads that might take you back here, but it's something about being in LA that, well, everyone's there too, to see you like all the big casting directors and producers and stuff. But also there's just this weird sort of like reverence that you're like an LA actor. Um, But it's so funny, like, okay, I was, in LA in, in January and February and I had this meeting at um, a big network, like the heads of casting that they wanted to meet me. So I go on and they just are like, <laughs> they were, they were lovely, but it was just so funny. It felt so Hollywood. They're like, who are you? And I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm Jess. I live in Canada. And they're like, yeah, we know you want to get out of Canada. Right. And I was like, <laughs> well, Canada's actually been really good to me. And they're like, yeah, but you want to get out of Canada. <laughs> and it was this funny thing there. I was, I felt so like defensive. Like I was like, well, not necessarily. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and they're like, okay, well, you know, cause I had to go back to Toronto for a bit and I was going back and they're like, come back here for longer. We want to like get you on one of our shows, blah, 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 blah. And of course I got on two of their shows filming here. Like uh-huh. everything's always bringing me back here and it's, I fucking love it. Like I love living. I love working in Toronto. I love the crews in Toronto. I love the actors here. Mm-hmm. I love this. Like I, I do love this country. Mm-hmm. Um, it, I mean, it, it, it's fucked up in many ways and has like such a dark, discussing history um and yet i love the my community here like my people here um and so i i I don't know it it shifts all the time it really shifts all the time like but right now i'm like fine here Mm -hmm. i'm good here i love my neighborhood yeah (laughs) you're from winnipeg Yeah. yeah Um, so how was it sort of like being from Winnipeg, transitioning to Toronto? Do you feel like there's a difference in the way that you can express yourself here versus there? Um, or that you have expressed yourself? Well, I moved here when I was 18. So it was, yeah, I wasn't really an adult yet, you know, like, so I wasn't really expressing myself, I guess, anyway. Um, Winnipeg has changed a lot and there's some cool stuff happening there for sure. Um, I just really needed to 
move out of my parents' house. Like part of my evolution as a person is I needed to be far away from them mm. <laughs> to grow. Um, so it's, for me, it's, uh, I'm realizing how much that was actually the most important thing rather than like, Oh, Winnipeg versus Toronto. It was really just like, I needed to be on my own. Mm. And I fell in love with Toronto right away. I really did. Cause especially Winnipeg at the time. And I mean, still now, but Winnipeg is quite an edgy city. Like it, there's a lot of crime compared to other parts of Canada and it's a bit dodgy. It's part of what I love about it, but it's also like when I moved here, I moved to like church and Gerard, mm -hmm. which some people would be like, that's such a sketchy area. And I felt so safe here. I was like, I could walk down the street at three in the morning and like, no problem and i like wouldn't walk downtown winnipeg any time of the day by myself like it was way too sketchy so i felt like this um i don't i just felt so safe here mm -hmm. like safer mm -hmm. um and yeah I, I went to theater school here so that was just such a huge part of you know my did you move here to go to randolph yeah yeah um, but yeah, it was a big part of like my, you know, self-discovery and mm -hmm. being able to play and be creative and, and sort of start to find my own voice. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was a relatively easy transition. <laughs> like, I think it was easy because I had school too. Yeah. I know a lot of people that move here as adults can find it hard to make friends. Mm -hmm. um, but be, again, because I was in a school setting, it's sort of like you had friends no matter what, because you're in class together all the time. Especially that kind of school, because you're really like yeah. bonding and working together and opening up. Mm -hmm. It's a conservatory. So like, it's really small class and you're like with the same people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you're doing creative things, you know? <laughs> you're dancing with each other you're singing with each other you're playing it's mm -hmm. yeah what do you do now to tap into that creative energy in terms of like I guess what do you re what tools do you rely on is it like personality dance spirituality dance yeah dance is huge for me I when this is not happening I often go to like ecstatic dance like mm -hmm. Toronto ecstatic dance just to like I don't want to learn choreography. I just want to dance and move my body and like, like express. Mm -hmm. um, during quarantine, I've been doing that on uh, Instagram live. This guy named Ryan Heffington does classes um, five days of the week, which mm -hmm. I do almost every time I can. Um, but yeah, d d music and dance is when I'm really feeling clogged up, <laughs> it's like, it, it helps so much. Yeah. It helps move things through my body. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there's such a connection between like fluidity in our body and our movement and fluidity in our minds. When we're like actually like doing that, it's like, oh, the ideas are starting to come. Yeah, it's true. It's so true. You start kind of having visions. It's like, yeah, oh. yeah. that's a really good way to put it. Arts, when I'm, I get the most ideas either for like a painting, but also for like a show I want to curate when I'm at a concert and like, mm. thing, and then like, I'm not necessarily musical, um, but because mm -hmm. what inspires me. And then especially when I'm like moving my body to that music, all of a sudden I start to see like a whole new show I want to curate. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I love that. Um, okay. When you are in like the full swing of things and it's that, you know, say like what your year would have looked like if all of these things were booked, like how do you find the time to do all of that and be creative and be writing and working on a new project and like living your life and seeing your friends and doing that. So many emerging artists really struggle with like balancing art and creativity and work and life and friends and family. And 
Um, mm-hmm. You just end up hearing like, well, I want to be creative. I want to be working on my art, but I don't have time right now. And so how did mm-hmm. you find the time, especially when you were starting out to like work and live your life, but pursue things and get it to a point of it becoming your full-time job? Right. Uh, okay. Well, honestly, sometimes I'm not like that. I'm really not. Sometimes I'm just work and sometimes I'm work and friends and sometimes I'm, you know, work and dance class. Um, but I'd say there's been times where I've had to get very, very clear on spaces that again, talking kind of like about the desire map and your core desired feelings, mm-hmm. spaces that actually make me feel what I want to feel. Because sometimes there's things that I just pile on myself that it's like, like I could be like, man, I got to release a new bitches be witches um, uh, uh, post like now or whatever. And it's like, wait, I actually don't know if that's going to give me the feeling I want right now. Like, I don't know if that's the place that I want to do that. Maybe I, I actually don't want to feel that sort of like public display. Mm -hmm. I think I just need to privately journal or dance or whatever. And so it's just sort of like really checking in, not doing things because this is how I always operate. It's like, mm, I think I, I think, a lot of the suffering we put on ourselves is like when we keep telling ourselves like, this is how I have to, this is my identity now. I'm like this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, uh, how about your identity is just like always here and safe who you are. It's not about like, if you can be producing and, you know, be working and be super social. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've had to fine tune that sometimes. Mm-hmm. Let go of things, let go of things, and be like, mm, "This isn't really." To be honest, I don't really want to do this right now. Yeah, <laughs> and and it's like, I mean, it's a fine line, right? Because it's like, oh, am I scared to do it? Am I being lazy? Am I blah blah blah? But if I can just be like, no, actually, I just want to like really listen to this song and fucking cry. <laughs> which I was doing before this this podcast um, it's like I have to be okay that it's not being fucking productive in the way that we think you know mm-hmm. it's like yeah it's tricky it's tricky I mean I, I I feel for artists that like you for me it's a little bit different because I'm an actor I get hired for things so my work isn't totally, um, it doesn't totally rely on me being like the sole creator and res- the person who's like super responsible for it. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like I'm part of something, but I'm not, again, it's not my baby. I'm not responsible for it. So it feels a little bit like way less pressure. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fun. So it's like, oh, this is fun. Um, so, I mean, I, I feel lucky in that way because there's a little bit of a pressure taken off because I don't have to associate, oh, the way I'm going to make my money and be able to live is on my creation. It's like, no, actually the way I make my money and live is being a part of someone else's creation. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So so I, I can kind of, put, I, I'm able to put less pressure on myself mm-hmm. to create, you know? Yeah. It is interesting too, like how much of us being overloaded, it's true. If we could actually just be honest with ourselves about what projects we actually want to be working on or not and say no to all the things that are not like, yeah, in line with Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if it's integrity or just like integrity with ourselves. Yeah. What do I want to be feeling? Is this actually going to be accomplishing? Because I bet you can eliminate half the things on your schedule if you went through that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember getting like a really big opportunity to curate um, for a pretty big organization in the film industry and uh, to curate a show for a huge event they were doing. And it just being like, 
you know, I wanted the opportunity, but the actual mm-hmm. product is like not really invested in it at all. And it was somewhat of like a toxic environment. Um, mm. And then being like a few nights before mm-hmm. and just being like, I just don't want to do this. So I'm just not going to do it. I pass things off enough to not leave them in sure. position. But yeah, saying no and people being like, yeah, but it's these people. Just finish it. Just like have that, you know, good relationship. Mm-hmm. It's just like, no, I like, I just don't want wow. to. And then feeling like, oh my God, am I going to regret this? But like, no, just like every day exactly. that went on being like, I'm so fucking glad I said no to that. Cause it just created wow. more space for other things. Yeah. I oh, that's to. so brave. That's really brave. <laughs> it's hard to do that. It's hard to do that sometimes. And it's true too that sometimes you like, you have the now magazine or whatever on that vision board. And so you think, Oh, I got that opportunity. I have to work with them. But then when you actually get it, sometimes it's not actually what you totally wanted or. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. There's definitely been things on there in past years. I mean, I haven't done vision board in a long time now, but I used to do them all the time. And there's definitely things where I'd look and be like, really? I don't actually want to do that. <laughs> I don't actually want to work for those people. I actually don't really want to travel to that place that I put on there. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting, actually, to go back and look at that. Hmm. Um, one thing I wanted to talk to you about is rejection. Mm-hmm. Um. And (laughs) as a visual artist, I'm lucky because I get to create the final product and, and have a say in like exactly when and how I put myself out there and expose myself. But as an actor, Mm. you're you're doing live auditions. And so you don't really get the ability to do that. Um, And I feel like there's way more no's than yes. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's like, how do you deal with, that rejection and you know like I'm better at it now yeah um but also I have a body of work now that I can be like you know obviously I people have liked me before so (laughs) but uh so in that way it's easier and I acknowledge that that I'm like kind of in a very different position than a, a new actor Mm -hmm. it's fucking shit like rejection is hard it's hard it what's hard about it I think more than anything for me it was less about rejection it was more about all the fucking expectations I put on it and the hopes that I put on it like if I got this part it would change my life my whole life would be different and and I, I mean I just have to keep sometimes reminding myself once I started really working a lot, it was honestly because I, I really shifted how I was auditioning. Mm. And I started really having fun because mm-hmm. I realized, I mean, Brian Cranston has said this before. A lot of actors quote him on it, that he's like, just treat the audition like a chance to, to perform this. And if you really love acting, then it should be a pleasure to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I realized when I was watching a play once that the actor I kept drawn being drawn to the actor I kept watching was the actors that just looked like they were having fun. Mm-hmm. Like I was, I was like, I want to watch someone who looks like they're having fun. They're not like so in their head and they're like, I need to like really get deep here. I really need to, um, I, I really need to, do anything it's just like and it can be a dramatic thing it doesn't have to be like "Ah." they can be dramatic and still be having fun Mm -hmm. it's it's an element of a an ease it's like a it's a play it's like like i can imagine i haven't seen like ian mckellen or like any of the older incredible veteran theater actors perform but i can imagine that there's something so beautiful about them in that they're their ease Mm -hmm. they're having fun they know they're on stage and they're so lucky that they get to do this and Mm -hmm. it's delicious to say these words when it's written well and to work with these other artists and 
so I feel like I started to go into auditions a little bit differently where I'd be like, how would I make, how am I going to have the most fun with this script? Mm -hmm. Like, how am I going to, what would make me enjoy it the most? And then when I did that, I started to show so much more of myself because it would be like, oh, well, I would say it in this tone or I would, you know, make this into a joke or da, da, da. And I feel like it, it, I, I, I would assume what started to happen is my audition started to stand out because it wasn't what, oh, I'm going to try to anticipate what they want, mm -hmm. what they want me to be like. I was like, okay, I'm going to just try to put as much of myself into this as I can. And, um, and so now also I'd say about rejection is I don't take it as personally because I, I just go, well, I showed them me mm -hmm. like, and if, if that's not what they're looking for, that's okay. Because sometimes I've auditioned for things and then watched it, you know, with a different actor who got the part. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that was the right choice. Like mm -hmm. that's the right, that, that tone makes sense with, everything else in the world that they've created for this. And they have this beautiful quality that is just so interesting. And so them, like, it's not me. I can't, I can't pretend that's me. It's not. So, um, it was just all about like, who do I want to watch on TV? Yeah. And, uh, you know, just being really Gandhi about it, like be the change you want to see in the world. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, but, um, it can be hard like i and it's you know when people say like oh the the people who really make it are the people that like if you're running a marathon it's like the last kilometer is like the hardest kilometer because you're like so close to the finish line and yet you're like fatigue is really hitting you and it's a lot of people give up like right at the end sort of thing and it is true, I think, because there's been moments where I've gotten, like, the, like in the past couple of years, where I've been so fucking close to something that was going to change my life and not got it mm -hmm. several times. Like, big things where I'm, like, flown to L.A. to audition and, you know, I, and I think I have it. And it's hard not to get excited because you're like, oh, my gosh, this is, like a big deal and not get it. And literally you just go back to square one. Mm. You could have had a job that like would have made more money than you've ever made in your life. And then you don't get it. And you're just like, go back to your apartment in Toronto. And you're like, wow. You know, mm -hmm. and that those are hard. It's hard. Cause you're so close. You're so fucking close. And I don't know how I've met. Those were the hardest parts though. Like the closer you get, sometimes the harder it gets. Mm -hmm. um, because you also know what it could be like. Like you start to, it doesn't feel so separate from you. You're like, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what started to change. I think when I, when I had those big rejections, all of a sudden I, well, I just kept doing class. I kept fucking working. I kept auditioning. I, I let myself cry for like two days and then I'd be like, get the, get back up, like get back up because you love this. That's the thing too, is that I actually fucking love it. So it's fun and it, and it, and it soothes me too, to, to get to play. And so, um, yeah, just the, it's so, it can, it can be really Did hard did seeing that you were getting those auditions and having the feeling of like, I yeah, make you more prepared for the next one. And like, yeah, it did confidence boost in a way also. Yeah, it did. I mean, at the time, you know, my agent would be like, you know, you got to just take this as a compliment. I said, like, you know, Jess, you're being, you're, you're in the rooms. Like, that's good. You know, you're being considered. And I'd be like, yeah. Okay. Like I couldn't hear that yet. You know, I was just like still in the rejection phase. I'm like, yeah, whatever. 
I'm never going to get another job again. Like you just go spiral out. Like I'm going to quit acting. Like, like I would sometimes be like, literally go from there being like, I'm about to be a leader on a new t- TV show to being like, I'm quitting acting. I'm done. Like no more, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I have to go through all of that. Cause it's, it's true. That's how I was feeling. Um, but then I just go back to the joy, like go back to the fun. Yeah. It's, it, and if you really like it, then, I think, I think if you really like it, you'll always kind of do it and it doesn't have to necessarily be your career, but I think you'll always find yourself kind of doing it. And um, once you're over the pain of it, of the rejection, mm-hmm. like you didn't actually lose anything. That's like, the thing too. That they're like, nothing actually happened. You're fine. Like you're exactly where you were before yeah. it happened. So you just keep, you're still going in that forward direction. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely like the first time I had a big audition like that in in LA I had crazy imposter syndrome like it was like why the hell would they hire me I'm in Canadian like uh, like I have like nothing on my resume like they'd never hire me blah 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 this is so stupid I'm blah blah and I got really close to get it then the next year I get I have something else that's a big thing too And that time I had just a smidge less imposter syndrome Mm. because I'd done it before. So I was like, okay, I know what it's like to walk onto a studio lot and like, you know, see all the producers go into the room and know that like your fate is about to be decided. Mm -hmm. Okay. I know what that's like. And then the next, don't get that next time again, just slight less imposter syndrome. So it was just like, it's like practice. It's really just practice. And like, especially with my career, I feel like it's been, practice Mm -hmm. it's I have not had a break that's like oh my gosh I just got this big gig it's been very incremental very one line on a show two lines on a show Mm -hmm. two scenes two episodes like just very incremental Mm -hmm. because if everything happened if I if I got a big gig right at the beginning of my career I'd have completely Mm self-sabotaged I had I I would have had the worst imposter syndrome mm-hmm. of I shouldn't be here. I'm not good at this. That's the thing. There's so many obstacles in the way of actually like doing your work. And it's all that shit. It's yeah. like, I'm not good enough. That person doesn't like me. The director wishes they hired someone else. My coworker hates me. Like, it- <laughs> And everyone's thinking the same thing. I know. Everyone's thinking about each other. And meanwhile, no one's thinking it about anyone. Exactly. It's, um, I've learned a lot about taking up space. That's mm-hmm. a huge difference. Is Now, when I first started on sets, it would be like, I better not forget my line because it's costing them hundreds of thousands of dollars every hour. I can't like waste their time. I'm, they're going to fire me. Or da, da, da. Now, if I forget a line, I just like take a deep breath. Can I go again? Cool. Just do it. Like it's like short circuiting that whole spiral Mm -hmm. and just being like, just breathe. Mm -hmm. You can make mistakes. You can make mistakes. People make mistakes. I've seen huge stars and actors make big mistakes, Mm -hmm. big mistakes, whatever the fuck that means, but forget huge parts of lines, not be able to remember their lines. Like, you know, be be racked with self-doubt i've seen oscar award winners be racked with Mm self-doubt be like i don't know if i did if that was a good choice oh do you think that was literally asking me being like do you think that do you think that was okay (laughs) i'm like what so when you just see like oh my gosh we're all just doing our best we're all just doing our best like have some compassion for yourself how do you um how do you stay grounded in this industry when like you have to go, I would imagine into a lot of dark places or just emotional places and dip into it to be able to get that on set. And you're spending so much time trying to be someone else and whatever character it is that you're working on. So um, to like spend so much of your time taking yourself out of yourself and then Mm -hmm. dealing with rejection on top of that but then Mm -hmm. staying grounded so that you can manage and cope with all of it. Like, how do you do that? Ooh. Uh, I 
Um, again, I'm better at it now, but um, I think every actor sort of works a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. For me, I don't really stay in the character. I def it definitely affects my life. Like, if I'm playing someone who's like really direct and really um, serious. Mm -hmm. I, and if I'm playing that person for a long time and I'm doing it a lot, I kind of start to, uh, I'm a bit, I, I do take that a bit with me, mm -hmm. but I do try to release it. I mean, I try to surround myself with friends. A lot of, I have a lot of friends that aren't actors that like aren't in the industry mm -hmm. that also are so grounded and like, consistent <laughs> in themselves and I feel like that's actually been really helpful mm -hmm. um especially as a young actor it's really hard to be around a lot of actors I think unless you're already really grounded but that's an anomaly like being grounded in your early 20s isn't <laughs> usually um how you how one feels sometimes though mm -hmm. um and uh yeah, so I feel like once I started to find like a group of people that weren't just actors, mm -hmm. that was really important for me. Um, I'm so, I mean, so many of my close friends are still actors. I fucking love actors. It's just about like my personal life, you know, like really, um, knowing when sometimes I need to like take a break and not be talking about the industry. Mm -hmm. Like you can spiral the fuck out. Trust me. People do all the time. Like my fucking agent is such a piece of shit or like, yeah, no one will see me anymore because I did this part or like nobody wants my type or this casting director hates my guts. I mean, sometimes that stuff can be true and whatever, but if you just keep sp sometimes actors just spiral the fuck out about that stuff and it's like sometimes i just to be like oh my god we're missing the point like you know like just be an artist like i don't even know what the fuck that really means but <laughs> i just mean like stop trying to let other people give you permission to be creative to be yourself um so yeah anyway it's uh it's um it's it I always have to re-navigate that, like mm -hmm. how to stay grounded. Yeah. And I think another thing is sometimes um you can I can fall into like again, like maybe coasting sometimes, being like, I got this, I got this. And then sometimes I'll be like, oh wait, I need to re-examine like something about my craft i'm missing something again and i have to like go back like to think that you're a master of anything or like that you're like oh, i gotta figure it out it's a fucking trap like you have to always be growing and that's why i always try to take class like i'm like i need to always stay in class because i if as soon as i think that i got it figured out i'm i'm no bueno so mm -hmm. um yeah yeah and almost, i try to want go on almost all of the really successful artists that i have worked with or talked to when you talk to them they're saying they're in school in mm -hmm. some way or another whether they're teaching themselves something or they're still going to classes because it's like i think the more you learn in any field you realize that you have so much more to learn exactly and you, you don't want to especially you know i your age, like plateau, you're not even close. You still yeah. have so much growing and so much learning. So it's, it's good to actually be engaged in that and not just saying like, oh, I got these parts. Yeah. So I'm mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's um, also another trap of <laughs> the industry, especially like as you start to become more public, you know, and people, you know, people know you more. They'll 
they make assumptions about you're like oh it's so easy for her or like or like oh you're you're set or blah 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 and then if you start to internalize that and be like okay yeah i'm set I, i'm set it's like wait what the fuck does that mean no mm-hmm. you have to, don't plateau keep growing like mm-hmm. you know what i mean and i i bet that a lot of actors who've been famous for a long time have gone through some weird ebbs and flows with that Mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um but yeah it's definitely all about that uh inner work why you're really doing this like why you're really why you're doing this because if it starts to become about like fame mm-hmm. and fame i mean fame can be useful in that it can help you you know get certain parts that you or tell certain stories you want to tell you know if you have star power you can power projects that you really want to see out in the world which Mm is amazing um but if again if your goal is fame i feel like it disrupts something really sacred in an artist Mm -hmm. which is trying to be often like for me it's like as an actor it's like you got to try to be as egoless as possible. Mm-hmm. You have to keep checking in with that shit because you're trying to be humble enough to play anyone, mm-hmm. you know, like to, to really understand where anyone could be at a certain point in time. Mm-hmm. And if you start to get all weird and start putting yourself up on some pedestal, cause other people are, that's, that's messy that's such a (laughs) perspective of like why to let go of the ego because so often you hear people talking about it from a place of so that you're not perceived a certain way or so that people Mm. more or all these things (laughs) (laughs) like you can actually be able to like embody and pay tribute to and connect with other people's work and other people's Mm -hmm. vision so yeah Mm -hmm mm-hmm mm-hmm oh yeah because once you start to be like you know i don't want to play like powerless people or i don't want to play da, da, da. i understand some people don't want to play things that are like stereotypes mm-hmm. or you know thoughtless writing hell no but if it's about like i only play heroes or heroines or whatever it's like what about humanity like i I just want to play people like i just want to play honest conflicted textured people Mm -hmm. (laughs) because that's what the world is and like let's see that because it's fucked us up for so long watching people who like had their happily ever after Mm -hmm. or people that you know essentially just figured it out and now they're great it's like hmm it it's so much more complex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is there is there a dream role? Is there like the ultimate mm-hmm. that you're working towards and figuring out everything in between, or is it kind of all just like open? Right now, my dream role is that is part of like what I'm writing right now. To be honest, it's like this is such a dream project. Um, which has to do with playing a Portuguese immigrant in the late Mm seventies. And um, just a lot of things that we've, that we've layered on top of all of this is like, there's so much conflict. (laughs) Um, And there's such a courageousness. Um, I don't know if I have, I don't really, have like um specifically something that i can imagine again i kind of know how i want to feel i just want to be like really raw like like roles that will allow a woman to be really revealed and and raw Mm -hmm. and and those kind of shit that you watch and you go oh oh that's human you know, like, yeah. ooh, that's almost too hard to watch because it's too human. <laughs> okay. 
I, I, I feel like I'm part again, part of like why I do this is like, I, I, I want to do that. I want to be a vessel for that. I want people to be able to watch that and, and feel like, Oh, I'm, I'm not crazy that I feel those mm-hmm. feelings or I go to those places, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. What, um, what advice would you give to, I guess, future five-year-old girls out there? Ooh, the five-year-old girls. I want to be an actress. <laughs> huh. I would tell them to keep playing. Mm-hmm. Like, keep playing, keep performing and playing. I, I mean, yeah, I guess, but mostly the most important thing is to play and um i wouldn't say like watch movies and what and try to model people actually i wouldn't say that at all because i feel like we have this weird like voice of media in our heads that like we're supposed to play a character this way because that's how we've seen it played it's like no just like be yourself i if they want to be actors i'd be like play and do everything that makes you light up like Mm -hmm. go walk in the forest go you know ride your bike play with your friends go swimming like it's about exploring the world this the more that i think the more curious you are about the world the the better of an actor you're gonna be because you got to be curious about humanity and um the more things can like open you up and light you up, the more you'll find connections with different characters. And, and, um, my friend, Amy, um, Amy Nosbach, and she's an amazing playwright and actress. And, um, she hosts this artist retreat every summer at her farm. And she like, grew up going to this farm as a kid on the weekends and I was asking because it's just like acres of of fields and really really like rural nobody around like you don't hear any person around and um I was like wow this is so interesting to like have spent like so much of your youth here Mm. and she was like yeah I felt like it let me play for longer Mm. because I was coming here on the weekends. I wasn't just like going and playing video games with my friends or watching TV or like doing things that preteens were doing or whatever. She's like, I was alone creating stuff and listening to things and being like chasing animals and listening to birds. And I was just like, holy shit. And she's one of the most brilliant artists I know and one of the most creative minds I know, really. And I was like, that is such a gift you got as a young person. Mm -hmm. Just being in nature and like her parents had like all these like kind of wacky things around and like instruments and no TV, nothing there. It's like very like, you know, country home. Um, so, so yeah, I just think that that can, I I wouldn't be like, go get an agent, (laughs) go do this, da da da. It'd be like, just, you have so much time to explore that. Yeah. Be a kid. Be a kid. I would say that. You have to be a kid. Most of the adults I know, I'd say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Create that. Pardon? Try and recreate that. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And and people I know who were child actors that started really young are, like, living their childhood now. Like, mm-hmm. as adults. They, like, are, like, struggling to, like, find space and time to, like, just do things that they always wanted to do as a kid. Like, learn to ride a skateboard or, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like, learn things that they never had any time to do because they were working. Hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. And I think it really shapes your brain too. If you start to work really young, it's like, especially if you're on set, you're like, 
among adults. Yeah. You're not around other kids. Rarely are you, it's going to be a cast full of kids. It's like mm-hmm. one kid in a show around all these adults. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the ones that are like healthy of mind. I'm like blown away by when, when they get older, I'm like, wow, you have good parents. Cause yeah. they definitely like encouraged you to be kids outside of set. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> what is your advice for emerging artists in any genre who are afraid to put themselves out there and but wanting to um if it's honest people will connect with it mm-hmm. it's it, it it's this beautiful beautiful universal truth if it's honest people will connect with it it's like what it what shape it takes, what it looks like, doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. And so I would just be like, be honest. And if sometimes we don't know what that means, I'd be like, be at the edge of the unknown when you're creating, like be at the like, for me, I guess, because I'm I'm an actor and, and a writer, it's like, it feels really emotional. Like it feels like scary, like, Oh my gosh, this is, um, when I'm making something honest, I mean, Mm -hmm. it feels like, Ooh, that was vulnerable. Really. It's like, Ooh. Um, so I would just say it is a, it really is a gift to be, yourself like it's a gift to everyone else for you to be honest Mm -hmm. like it gives us permission it inspires us and like sometimes I think we can feel like this is no one cares this is self-indulgent it's not true Mm -hmm. it's not true and like if you're scared published under an anonymous name at first like (laughs) you know like you don't have to put your whole self out there right like you don't you don't have to be like fully owning this if it's that scary like be anonymous and then once you get comfortable you know you can show yourself the world or not Mm -hmm. Banksy doesn't yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's true yeah Yeah. (laughs) sometimes that gives it more appeal people are like "Ooh, who is that (laughs) yeah exactly exactly (laughs) well thank you so much for chatting with me today always my pleasure where can people find you if they would like to connect um you can find me uh on instagram at jess salguero and on twitter at jess salguero um you can check out bitches be witches again it's uh it doesn't have too much new stuff on it lately but check it out um yeah yeah thank you so much tiffany this is so this was so needed i needed this uh this is what I'm talking about, about creating stuff. It's like, you, like people need this. This is energizing for people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I find like often when you're being interviewed, even for myself, like I end up getting so much out of what I've said. Yeah. I didn't even know I <laughs> needed to like say or release or whatever, but yeah. Yeah. You're like, oh, I didn't even know I felt that way. Yeah. Oh shit. I just articulated something that I had kind of, rumbling inside me yeah (laughs) yeah it's great well thank you i love that you're doing this oh thank you (laughs) thank you so much for tuning in we hope you enjoyed connecting with jess as much as we did as always if you're feeling this episode please hit subscribe and share it with a friend to make sure you can catch all of the exciting guests we have in store thanks for listening 